Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Karen Hayes from Waterloo, Wisconsin. I'm a senior studying biology and saxophone in the UW-Madison Meadwitter School of Music. I am pleased to introduce Brandon Quarles, Associate Lecturer of Cla Classical Saxophone. Brandon is also the Executive Director and Soprano Saxophonist of Noise, a Chicago-based saxophone quartet that defies categorization by working at the junction of contemporary classical music and experimental improvisation. In today's Badger Talk, Brandon will walk us through two of the Beatles' most iconic recordings, Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane, showing us what makes them so revolutionary while illuminating the differences in the styles of their composers, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. An avid Beatles fan himself, Brandon recently designed and taught an undergraduate course on the music and history of the Beatles at Northwestern University and is happy to share a small segment of this material with you today. After the presentation, Brandon will take any and all Beatles questions that you may have. Please welcome Brandon Quarles. Hi. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for that great introduction. And so, uh, so, uh, so welcoming to be welcomed by you know one of your own students. And I'm really excited to be here with you all today, uh, wherever uh, you may be tuning in from, uh, to chat a little bit about my favorite thing on the planet, which is uh, this rock band called the Beatles. <laughs> um, and I'm excited to be here just to talk about two of my favorite songs uh, called Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. Now, I've loved the Beatles since I was about 15, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to teach a class on the band uh, while I was a graduate student there at Northwestern University. And I'm really excited to sort of take you down on this journey today. So these two songs that we're going to talk about were originally released as a single in February of 1967, before the band would release probably its most celebrated album, which is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And I love to look at these two songs in particular because they really capture a special moment in the history of the Beatles, um, when both John Lennon and Paul McCartney, as well as George Harrison and Ringo Starr, were really pushing themselves to try things in recorded pop and rock music that hadn't really been done before. And today we're going to go behind the scenes to see how these tracks uh, were made and discuss a little bit about how they represent the musical styles of their uh, respective songwriters. So good little Beatles pun here to take us back. Yes, I can take you back uh, to where you came from. So first, before we head into those two songs, let's go back a little bit and uh, get a little bit of context and a little bit of uh, historical uh, viewpoint on where uh, the Beatles were at in their career and their lives uh, before they recorded these works. So what you're seeing here is a photograph of uh, the very last performance of the Beatles, which took place on August 29th of 1966 at San Francisco's Candlestick Park, home of the San Francisco Giants. And they had been touring relentlessly for years up to this point. And they were completely over the fact that nobody could really hear them and they really couldn't hear themselves. You know, these were some of the very first stadium concerts. Uh, now, you know, uh, pre-pandemic, we, we knew and loved stadium concerts, right? And they may sound great. Uh, but back in the day, very primitive uh, audio uh, reinforcement. Nobody could really hear them. They couldn't hear themselves. And they were also getting really tired of, of being basically carted around uh, in these kind of armored wagons like you have to see here because the fans were so passionate and honestly a little bit crazy that they were really in danger actually at all times of being overrun by these fans and so this lifestyle was really starting to take a toll on them and they decided to give up touring which at that time right and still it was really how a lot of artists make their money and it seemed crazy it seemed insane that somebody uh would give up all of that uh in order to to just make music so now that they were free from the rigors of touring, the Beatles took some time off, actually, for the for pretty much almost the first time uh, to embark on some different projects. They had been touring pretty much nonstop. They had a little break here in early of 1966 before they actually worked on the Revolver album. Um, so this was only really the second time that they had had this much time to themselves to try some new things and explore some new stuff. They went their separate ways. So we have 
John Lennon actually going to Spain to film a film, to film a movie called How I Won the War and try out his sort of acting chops there. We had George Harrison going to India actually to study Indian classical music and the sitar with the sitar master Ravi Shankar. George had become very interested in Indian music in 1965 and would become a devout Hindu for, for his entire life and continue his interest in Indian music. Paul McCartney actually began work on a, uh, a soundtrack to a film called The Family Way, which he collaborated with their producer, George Martin, to create some, some beautiful orchestral pieces for that film. And our good friend Ringo Starr just kind of takes some time off. You know, he, uh, he was always never the one to really play drums uh, outside of the studio or off the stage. Um, so he uh, just really indulged in his, his new family and his young children and uh, taking up, uh, he really liked to buy suits of armor and sort of old Western uh, weaponry, these kind of things. And uh, just had a, you know, having a good time there and, and just enjoying himself with a little bit of time off. So it's around this time too that the pop rock LP, the long playing record, right? The 33 and a third RPM vinyl album really starts to come into its own. In the early 60s, the 45 RPM single really reigned supreme. Uh, you know, that's the, the main object, musical object that most people were buying at that time. But in the 60s, the way we consumed music was really starting to change. And in 1966, we see many albums released by sort of these big name uh, rock and pop acts that really start to redefine and recontextualize what uh, what the LP could be in rock music. You know, these are things like uh, the Rolling Stones' Aftermath, uh, the Birds' Fifth Dimension, the Who's A Quick One, and Bob Dylan even took it even further by making a double LP called Blonde on Blonde in 1966. But most impactful on the Beatles was an album by the Beach Boys, which was called Pet Sounds. And we see the album cover here. You know, released in May of 1966, Pet Sounds took the Beach Boys in a radically new direction by incorporating lavish and complex instrumental vocal and vocal arrangements. This wasn't really surf music anymore. It, it owed as much to Buck as it did to Chuck Berry. Lyrics about innocence and childhood pervaded the album, and it, and it has a cohesive sound about it. It wasn't just sort of one track after the other that were their own thing. Now, Brian Wilson, the sort of main creative energy behind the Beach Boys and composer, uh, was really actually inspired to make Pet Sounds by the Beatles. He was inspired by the album that they released in 1965, at the end of 65 in December, called Rubber Soul which Brian perceived really as maybe sort of the, one of the first rock albums that he felt was a, a complete body of work, a real cohesive statement. So he said, oh, I have to do something like that. And he created Pet Sounds. Now, Pet Sounds was uh, very much listened to by the Beatles. And Paul McCartney himself has even said that it's probably the greatest album of all time, one of his absolute favorites. And so as we start to get into these Beatles recordings, I want to listen to a small section of the song, the Beach Boys song called God Only Knows, um, which is a track from Pet Sounds here. And I want you to listen to just the sound of the record, try to identify some instruments that you're hearing, and think about how it's really not sounding a lot like what you might think of the Beach Boys, and what you might not think about rock and uh, pop music at this particular time as well. Here we go. a lot of different colors there and a lot of different sounds you know we even hear the orchestral french horn right at the beginning of the track it's beautiful sleigh bells and big walls of keyboards and all of these things are going to be really influential on the beatles and a couple of things that i like to just point out that make their way into these uh sergeant pepper era recording sessions 
there's going to be these multi-part arrangements. Um, you're going to hear many different instruments playing many different parts that Brian would sing out to them and they would play. You're also going to hear an expanded instrumentation, meaning that you're going to hear more than just kind of the two guitars, bass, and drums, and vocals uh, sort of instrumentation that you would expect in traditional sort of rock music. And you're also going to find them using studio technology really as an instrument, as a key player in making these sounds. They were really wondering about what can we do with the different electronics that we have and the ways that we can combine sounds and sort of change them and distort them to make new sounds that maybe had never existed before. And this directly influenced the Beatles' uh, work on the seminal album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Uh, now many critics have ranked this album as the greatest album of all time. Uh, when Rolling Stone magazine first put out its list of uh, the greatest 500 albums of all time, uh, they ranked Sgt. Pepper as number one uh, and actually had uh, Pet Sounds at number two. So these two have always been very closely linked sort of in our critical consciousness and were very much linked together in terms of uh, the way in which they were composed. The Beatles really wanted to uh, do their own pet sounds and really one-up them, really, the sort of friendly competition of those early days. So as we start to look into recording Sgt. Pepper, uh, we want to think about a couple things. You know, they actually did decide um, to try to do an album that kind of reflected on the Beatles' northern upbringing. So I've got you a map here, and you can see with the little A, little pin there, where Liverpool is in the UK. And that is in sort of the northern region there, um, as opposed to London, which is in the south. And now the North and Liverpool were sort of seen as, as sort of unrefined and not cultured by sort of the cosmopolitan Londoners of the day. That The Beatles really always embraced their working class backgrounds and wanted to sort of bring in those, um, the colors and sounds of, of that culture into their, into their records. And with no plans anymore to tour and pretty much unlimited studio time because Remember, it's the Beatles really at the height of their power here in late 66. Uh, the record company basically just giving them free reign of the EMI studio there. They were able to experiment really as much as they wanted to. And so when they enter the studio there uh, in late 1966, the first songs that they go for are new ones by John and, and Paul, first going for Strawberry Fields Forever, and then Paul McCartney's Penny Lane. So here are the two right, major songwriters of the Beatles, John Lennon on the right and Paul McCartney on the left, here in amazing 1967 uh, Flower Power go gear. And I like to look at these two tunes really because they, for me, show them sort of in their mature styles. They've really um, sort of blossomed into their own unique voices. In the beginning of the Beatles, they were really co-writing a lot of a lot of tracks very closely together they used to call it eyeball the eyeball sessions staring right into each other's eyes but as they matured they started sort of writing more individually and still having an influence on each other's work but we really see their own personalities come to the fore and i think these two songs really have uh, a lot uh, to say about that so we're gonna see uh that as it plays out now and first i want to look into starting with Strawberry Fields Forever, we will look at John Lennon's kind of style. And I want to point out a couple of key facts uh, or key traits of that style for you now. So um, Ian McDonald, who wrote a great book called Revolution in the Head on every track of that the Beatles put out, I highly recommend you check that out. This is one of the texts that I use in my Beatles class. Um, he points out that he describes John Lennon's melodies, his melodic style, as horizontal. And what he means when we say that is that really the notes uh, in the melody repeat a lot. They really kind of go in a straight line rather than changing notes going up and down. And the, one of the best uh, Lennon-esque melodies that I always like to point out is, is the, the track I'm the Walrus, right? I am he as you are, he as you are, we. You know, it's just two notes basically going back and forth for a long time, <laughs> very horizontal, very, very straight there. And now with John, I like to sort of say that he goes for kind of feeling over form. So if the normal constraints or the traditional constraints of a pop song form aren't really fitting uh, his 
emotion or the or the motion of the lyric he's very happy to, to sort of break that off and and do whatever he needs to do to get that feeling across for you and we'll see that in strawberry fields forever and he also with his lyrics tends to go a bit more introspective but still has a really sort of playfulness about it really wanting to sort of play with the language and see what uh, what possibility, what beauty can maybe just come out of the words themselves and revealing some uh, some sort of, sort of deep psychological um, introspective things about his own self. So let's look a little bit about the context of, of Strawberry Fields Forever the Track. So Strawberry Field was a regal place. It was actually a Salvation Army children's home near Lennon's childhood Liverpool home. So this was a place where he would sort of sneak off um, and slip into the garden there and kind of be in his own fantasy land, a place where he could enjoy uh, the nature and imagine all the different things that could be there. The track was really written um, kind of while he was out there in Spain and uh, on the set of How I Won the War during this period of self-doubt, kind of brought on by a bunch of different things, probably really by sort of his use of, of the hallucinogenic LSD, the psychedelic drug, as well as the fact that his personal affairs um, were really kind of splintering off and life was really changing. Um, this is a photograph, a very old photograph, of John Lennon on the left and his mother, Julia, on the right. And John's childhood was really challenging and, and really sort of turbulent in that his mother and father split up really early on, uh, he barely knew his father. His mother left uh, him basically in the care of his aunt Mimi, uh, who raised him. And his mother was around, sort of coming in and out of his life, um, sort of almost like an older sister type figure, before she unfortunately was killed in a very tragic car accident um, when John was just 17 years old. So he always had this sort of deep-seated pain about that and about that, of that childhood. He was also becoming very uncomfortable with the fame that the Beatles had had and the success and always being in the spotlight. Um, if you really want to know how he feels, you can listen to the song Help from 1965. He's described that as being a cry for help that he really meant. <laughs> now with Strawberry Fields Forever, it's really interesting to note too that this track took 55 hours of recording time spread out about out over November and 19, or sorry, November and December of 1966. Now, maybe to our modern uh, ears, that, that may not sound like a lot, still kind of sounds like a lot to me even, um, but we often see people spending a long time on, on an album or a recording. But for context, in 1963, when the Beatles recorded their very first album called Please Please Me, uh, that whole album took them 10 hours to do. They did it all in a day. <laughs> um, so to spend 55 hours on one song, on one track, it was certainly sort of a new um, a a avenue that they were looking into and trying some new things. So a little bit to note about Strawberry Fields Forever, the song, you know, we're going to see some surreal and stream of consciousness style lyrics. I've got you here a Rene Magritte painting, um, so you can sort of get a little bit of surrealism in your eyes as we get ready to get it in our ears. We're also going to hear lyrics that have a childlike perspective, okay, that really kind of take us into that Strawberry Fields garden and see what's sort of poking around in there. The song is also very harmonically adventurous. And what I mean by that is that the chords, so the, the, the sort of background of, of, the, of the song, the harmony there, is uh, sort of going in places that we wouldn't really expect a normal, uh, traditional pop song to kind of go for. Some really interesting stuff here. And the song also has what I like to call a verse chorus song structure. As we'll see, um, normally you sort of start with the verse and you do the chorus and you do another verse. This song pops right into the chorus right from the get-go, um, which is something that Beatles sort of championed um, in the early days, even with a song called She Loves You. So let's take a listen and look at the second verse, which I think is uh, really indicative sort of of this lyrical style. And we're also going to listen for the horizontal melody. Okay, remember that the, the repeated note pattern thinking about a melody not moving a lot. Let's listen for those childlike qualities of lyrics as well. Here we go. No one I think is in my tree. I mean, it must be high or low. That is your kind, you know, tune in, but it's all right. That is, I think, 
Here, particularly in that first line, no one I think is in my tree. Right, it's just all the same note, very horizontal. And we also hear, right, those childlike um, perspective, like the child, a kid climbing the tree, right, and all of a sudden being so high up that they feel like they can see everything and have this power up there. But we're also hearing the sort of emotional instability. I mean, it must be high or low. Maybe it's talking about the tree. Maybe he's talking about good or bad feelings. And then we see there's this third and second line there, very stream of consciousness, very just kind of getting out like we like we do in sort of normal speech to as we try to talk to our friends. You know, that is, you can't, you know, tune in, but it's all right. That is, I think it's not too bad. You know, you're constantly sort of second guessing yourself and sort of switching around the sort of emotional turbulence here really sort of indicative of that kind of Lenin style. And so in the last clip, I want to talk now about sort of the production and orchestration a little bit, highlighting some, some key points. And you heard in the last bit there in that second verse, the use of trumpets. Um, and this alludes very directly to the traditional brass bands that were found in Liverpool and other towns in the north. You can see here a, a sort of a Victorian era brass band. Um, what would this would be like? You know, almost every town and village would have a brass band that would provide music for the for the community, and so that sound um, here is sort of taking us back into that childhood, into that past, somewhere deep back in the back there. And we also hear cellos, these arrangement created by George Martin, the producer who is an amazing orchestrator and arranger, gives us this kind of classical music feeling that also gives us that feeling of the past. Right, we get some nostalgia here. We've got sort of a timeless feeling um, as we exist in this universe of strawberry fields. So we see these very traditional, maybe classical elements, historical elements being used, but we also see some new technology being used along here too. And this is an instrument that's called the Mellotron. So it looks like some kind of keyboard instrument, right? And what it is, is it's a very early sampling instrument uh, that uses tape loops. So all of us kind of know when you go to see a show today and you see the keyboard player playing on a digital keyboard, a lot of those are sampling instruments. They've taken really high quality recordings of the instrument that they're wanting to reproduce and slotted those in digitally. But in the very beginning, uh, we didn't have digital technology, so you had to record those onto different tape loops. So when you would press one of those keys, and have it on one of the instrument settings, say the trombone, uh, you would hear that note on a trombone come out. Pretty exciting, pre pretty exciting times. So in the beginning of the song, right in the beginning, the introduction is played on this Mellotron. And I want you to hear the intro and think about what sound do you think this is? What real world sound is it? What you're hearing there is Paul McCartney playing the Mellotron on its flute setting. Okay, so they take some really low, deep, warm flutes and playing it on this Mellotron. So we get the sound of flutes, um, but we get it in this sort of otherworldly way, right? In this electronic means um, that is sort of obscuring really what it is and creating this new sound. I want to look now too about again the sort of formal difference here about the song like i mentioned it, it jumps right into the chorus right after that mellotron intro and this is something jumping right into the chorus that they did with the song she loves you back all the way in 1963 and most songs usually start with a verse but by launching right into the chorus the song immediately immerses us into the sonic topography of the track we really get just plunged right into the deep end of the sonic world here so as we listen to this first chorus, I want you to also pay attention to the way in which the harmony, the chords, right, never seem to feel totally settled, never seem to be um, stuck in one place, always moving forward. And think about how that makes you feel. All right, here we go. Let's take a listen. Let me take you down. So we can really 
hear, right, how everything's kind of sliding and moving around in the harmony. It doesn't really feel very stable. And that, to me, really matches with the words, right? This idea that nothing is real. <laughs> uh, everything I'm hearing could be an illusion. Everything I'm seeing is an illusion. But here in Strawberry Fields, um, there's, there's nothing to get hung about. There's nothing um, that can cause me harm here. I'm sort of in a safe kind of place, even if it is somewhat surreal and magical. So let's talk about uh, what I always call putting the puzzle together. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there is some amazing um, editing work being done here behind the scenes to make this song possible. So after recording the very first version of the song, they, you know, they went through it a couple times and got a version that they felt kind of good about. John came in and said he wanted to do a faster version, that the original version way too slow, and also that the key needed to be higher um, so that they could take advantage of these cellos. And so they recorded two different versions, one slow and one fast. And they gave, as they were sort of want to do at this point, they gave tapes over so they could go and listen at home and think about what the work that they had done. And John Lennon came in and said, okay, I need the, the slow version and the fast version to be connected. He insisted that that fast one be spliced on to the end of the slow one to connect them together. And this, of course, made George Martin, the producer, and Jeff Emmerich, the engineer, you know, hold their head and say, oh, how are we going to do this? Um, because these things are at different tempos, they're at different speeds, and they're uh, in different keys, okay? So you can't just stitch them together. we got to figure out some way to sort of make this work. So how could this possibly be done, you know, they thought. And uh, what they came up with was pretty ingenious. Here you see this great photograph of, of George Martin on the right and John Lennon really thinking really hard about something, a really great photo here, while they're in the, the control room there at EMI at Abbey Road Studios. And so what happened is Jeff Emmerich basically came up with the idea that, okay, we need to change the speeds of these tapes, but I've got to make sure that the speed will match and that the temp and that the pitch will match. Because when you change the speed of a tape, the pitch will also change. If you make it go faster, the, the pitch will go up. If you make it go slower, the pitch will go down. So he decided that I can slow down the fast one by about 11.5% and speed up the slow one by just a hair. And Eureka, magically, those two things were perfectly in sync. Really, really wild. <laughs> and that's why, actually, when you, if you go to play along with Strawberry Fields Forever on the piano, it's going to exist somewhere kind of off the grid <laughs> from our sort of normal Western tuning system because the tapes have been manipulated here. But I want to play for you the second verse that we heard earlier. That part of the recording, of the released recording, actually comes from that second remake, the faster version. And I can play for you here what it sounded like when they originally recorded it in that faster version. Let's take a listen. Let me take you down, cause I'm going to Strawberry Fields. Nothing is real. Nothing to get hung about Strawberry feels forever so, That bit of the chorus and then it goes on into the second verse was originally recorded at that speed and you can feel like the temp right the tempo is really up and the key is higher and so let's take a listen to now the uh, the release version and right on the word going uh, let me take you down because I'm going to you'll feel the switch if you've got your ears on really hard and you'll hear that all of a sudden everything after that starts to sound a bit bit different and a bit funny. Let's listen. Let me take you down cuz I'm going to strawberry fields. Nothing is real. Here right feels like it's being like pulled apart like taffy <laughs> and everything's really slow and slurred right and that's because they took that recording and slowed it down by about 11.5 percent and that gives the voices and the cellos that quality of very dreamlike very otherworldly which is perfect for the song right perfect for the idea and this concept that nothing is real so Everything about that, from the lyrics, the melody, and the actual production technique, 
is being used in service of the mood of the song. Pretty ingenious stuff, particularly when you think about the fact that they uh, were using machines like this one. This is a tape machine, a studio tape machine that's really similar to the one the Beatles would have used um, in order to make these recordings. I always just like to point out, right, I think in our sort of normal parlance, we, you know, we think about making a cut, right, in a film or in, in music. And that we say cut because literally you would have to take a razor blade and cut that tape and splice it together to make it work, which is a pretty permanent thing to do. <laughs> you know, in our modern digital software, a cut like that takes basically no amount of time, pretty much one click, and it's pretty much perfect. <laughs> um, but here it really involved a lot of skill and a lot of ingenuity in, in order to even make that recording possible. So I hope that you sort of saw all that really great richness there to Strawberry Fields Forever. And maybe you heard some new things that you never heard before. I totally invite you to go back and listen again and listen to the way in which all of the elements are playing together. But let's now look at Penny Lane. We'll flip our single over, right? And we'll take a look at a track that was predominantly written by Paul McCartney. And we'll get a sense of his style here. So where uh, John Lennon's style was horizontal, we can describe Paul McCartney's style, melodic style, as vertical. The song I always really like to use, like Peak Paul McCartney, is a um, song from the White Album called Martha, My Dear. Martha, My Dear. <laughs> Martha, my dear, though I spend my days in conversation, please. It's all over the place, right? Jumping over, very sort of exuberant, very vertical. McCartney's a little bit more want to try some cool moves com compositionally in terms of moving around uh, with melody and, and the bass notes as well as the harmony. Uh, he's a little bit more interested maybe in music uh, for sort of music's sake and being able to um, do something interesting there. And his lyrics are often very extroverted and sometimes really silly, uh, often using characters. I mean, um, think about Sgt. Pepper, we've got Sgt. Pepper and uh, Billy Shears, and we have lovely Rita even on there and on down the line, Martha, um, et cetera, et cetera. But let's look at Penny Lane specifically. So the concept of a Liverpool-centric song had been around since River Soul. So John um, and Paul were writing a song called In My Life that comes from the River Soul album and actually started off um, as John sort of just writing out a bunch of places in Liverpool there, including Penny Lane, which you can see here is the bus stop in Penny Lane there back in the day. And it was just sort of a, a great hub. They all had to go through this bus interchange as they took the bus around town and had a lot of nostalgia for them, a lot of plus with a lot of memories. So John's looking at Strawberry Field and Paul is looking at Penny Lane. And we hear in, this, in these lyrics, again, the surrealistic quality, most likely probably inspired by uh, McCartney's own first experience with LSD. He was a bit of a holdout. He was the last Beal to, to go down that particular rabbit hole. Um, and we get those kind of colors here as well, but also just Paul's sort of exuberant uh, silliness too. And this track was recorded after Strawberry Field, it's forever, and uh, from late December of 1966 through January of 1967. So what I want to do here is I want to listen to a little bit, and I want you to listen for that vertical melodic quality, as well as listen for, you know, some mentions of some really interesting characters here. Penny Lane, there is a barber showing photographs Of every head he's had the pleasure to know And all the people that come and go Stop and say hello All right, so you can hear right, how the melody is really jumping around Even the bass part's really active And you might be also thinking to yourself like Boy, that um, kind of instrumental background back there sounds a lot like some of the stuff that I played for you from Pet Sounds, right? From the Beach Boys, that kind of keyboard, bouncy keyboard color. And Paul really came into the studio and said that he wanted this to sound, have a really clean sound, like Pet Sounds. That's how he described it, a clean sound. And so what they did in order to do that was they actually layered in the piano like four times, four different types of pianos that they had there at, at EMI studio there on Abbey Road and to get the sound. And so I can play for you actually just the piano tracks. Let's listen to just the how much richness and color there is in these pianos. Oh. All right, yeah, I can really hear the bounce and the 
sort of optimism of all that too, this really rich sound just from those pianos. So let's take a look at some of these surreal characters, right? We talk about in Penny Lane seemingly sort of mundane kind of things, right? There's a barber. Of course there's a barber, and there really was there in Penny Lane. Um, but instead of thinking about, um, you know, like when you go to the barber and uh, they have the images of different haircuts you could get, right, different displays, you could say, hey, the, the barber like has a little collection of haircuts I can get. Or you could sort of do a little surreal move and say there's a barber showing photographs of every head he's had the pleasure to know, right? Sort of this funny way of looking at a really just pretty normal everyday occurrence of getting your hair cut. Um, and sometimes in the song, if you listen closely, you'll hear some of these characters get little audio sounds, like little sound effects that um, are sort of giving us little audio images of their characters. So one of those is the fireman, right? That's in the song. And he's talking about the fireman has a clean machine. And I want you to listen for what happens. Here we go. Clean machine. Nice, you hear that little ringing of the bell, right? Ding, 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 ding. Just like an old fire engine would have, they'd have a big bell as they came through town um, instead of like our sort of big modern sirens, right? They'd ring in that big bell, and that pops up over throughout the track. We don't have time to sort of go through all of them today, but I encourage you to go listen and hear the characters and try to find their little, some little sonic uh, signifier of, of their thing. So let's take a listen here too, just just the chorus. Whoop. Trying to get a software update. That's fun, huh? Oh wow. You gonna let me do that? <laughs> Sorry, friends. Let me just sort of do this really quickly. Okay, there we go. Now we should have our screen back. Sorry about that. Thanks, Apple. So with Penny Lane, uh, I want us to listen to the chorus and think about these images of blue suburban skies and just so it's all in your ears and in your eyes and hear how the lyrics and the melody really go along with that. Strange, Penny Lane is in my ears and in my eyes. Bounce that's always going on. And again, you hear that brass section, right? Those trumpets really alluding again to those northern brass bands. But here we've got a very special type of trumpet that's about to happen, a very famous solo in the song that's done on what's called a piccolo trumpet. Now, this piccolo trumpet part was inspired directly by Johann Sebastian Bach's second Brandenburg concerto, okay? This uh, group of, of instruments um, playing together. And... Basically, Paul McCartney was watching the BBC one night and heard this performance of, of the Bach Second Brandenburg Concerto, and he was like, "Oh my God, that that beautiful high trumpet sound, that's amazing!" And he came into the studio the next day and said, "Hey, we gotta have one of those kind of piccolo trumpets on this song." And since Paul McCartney, they basically just called up the BBC and they got the exact same piccolo trumpet player, uh, whose name was David Mason, to come into Abbey Road and play this amazing piccolo trumpet solo. Thanks for getting my mouse off there. Sorry about that. So, you hear just how amazing and classical sounding that is, right? That's definitely not a thing that you would expect to hear uh, in a traditional rock song, even from the Beatles just a few years before that. So as we wrap up here, I want to take a look at, just give you the info about sort of the release of Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. Again, it was put out as a double A-side single, meaning that they just thought both, both tracks were just so good, they both had to be the A-side. And it was released on February 13th in the U.S. and February 17th in the U.K. Now, what's really interesting, though, is that even though we think about these two tracks as really peak Beatles, uh, peak Beatle creativity, it was the first Beatles single since 1963's Please Please Me to not reach number one in the United Kingdom. Okay? Um, and so that was felt as sort of a major kind of blow, a stun, right? Here are the Beatles at the top of their game. They've taken off touring. Everybody's wondering, ah, are they going to be able to really, is it finally over? Has the bubble burst? 
and they come out with these tracks, which are certainly we know are amazing, um, but they they only make it to number two <laughs> uh, on the chart, which is pretty wild. And it's just crazy to think about the fact that it was blocked by um, a song called Release Me by Engelbert Humperdinck. And we don't have time to play that one here today, but why don't you go check that out and you'll hear, it's like a generational divide really on, in music here where you can hear the old sort of um, more 50s style, early 60s style sort of ballad thing that plenty of people were still buying, obviously. And, um, and then how radically different something like Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane is. It's a huge, huge uh, jump <laughs> and just indifferent in style. And that's where they blocked them from, from, from being number one. And we know now too that they would go on to create, uh, after this release, you know, probably the most celebrated LP in all of pop and rock, uh, what is called Stra uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So that's what I got for you today and just would love to hear any questions that you may have. Uh, here's just a really goofy photo of the guys just as a way to kind of wrap up. But um, thank you so much for allowing me to just kind of chat with you here today and share some information about these songs. And uh, looking forward to just hearing any questions that you have and, and taking those as we go. So thanks, everybody. Brandon, thanks so much. Uh, you're taking us back 60-ish years today. That's I, I know for all of us who are Beatles fans, every time you get pulled into a conversation about it, all the memories stir up and it just is such a wonderful trip to take with you. So thank you so much. And I know you're a saxophone player, but your singing was spot on. And I think <laughs> that you sound a lot like Paul McCartney when you sing. I don't know Ooh. if anybody out there agrees with me, but. <laughs> well, thanks. I'll take that one. I can put that in my bio now. It sounds good. <laughs> so uh, we did have a lot of followers today. Of course, there's tons of Beatles fans, but yes. some questions that came up. Um, so let's see, Rick Charlie is asking, is this the first uh, song? He's talking about Strawberry Fields. Were they extensively used in orchestra? Hmm, that's a great question. Let me uh, let me think and make sure. So the first time that they used strings actually was on the song called Yesterday, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Um, and that was like a, a major like, whoa, okay, uh, you know, the Beatles are using strings, right? There's only, Paul McCartney is the only Beatle that even appears on that track at all, singing and playing the guitar. And that was sort of seen as a very radical departure from from the stuff like Please Please Me or She Loves You that they had been doing before. Um, so full orchestra stuff, in a certain sense, I mean, Strawberry Fields River only has, uh, what was it? Th uh, three trumpets and four cellos or it's four trumpets and three cellos <laughs> i can't remember so it's not a full orchestra but they actually uh maybe to sort of illuminate this as well you know hiring an orchestra for a recording session is quite expensive because you have to pay every musician um, in that orchestra so even when they did um, you may be familiar with the song called a day in the life which does feature an orchestra um, at the end of sergeant pepper's lonely hearts could land that uh, they couldn't hire an entire orchestra they had to pay for half and record it twice so that it would sound like a full orchestra. <laughs> um, so even the Beatles had were limited a little bit by budget concerns. So something to think about. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, Anne Stevening Rowe asks, what are your thoughts on Paul as a bass player? She says she loves his work on Dear Prudence. Yeah. Yeah. Dear Prudence is one of the great bass tracks. I mean, Paul McCartney will forever go down as one of the icons of the bass uh, in any style, I would say, um, you know, what's really, really cool is if you can, you can go back and, and kind of trace Paul McCartney as a bass player. And, um, you can really hear the influence of Motown, the Motown session players on, on Paul McCartney's bass playing, particularly in like 1965 and 66. And a lot of people will say, I know that, I know Jeff Emmerich, the engineer of this, a lot of the sessions thinks this, that uh, Sergeant Pepper has like the best um, sort of bass lines and bass sounds on there. So I'm a big fan. And as a, as a very amateur bass player myself too, yeah, I, I try to take as much as I can uh, out of that stuff, but, you know, very melodic, very um, ha having its, its own really voice in the, in the band. You have a lot of uh, very knowledgeable Beatle fans out here commenting. And so I just... Right give credit to Joyce Weimer. As soon as you mentioned that piccolo trump trumpet segment, she said, Dave Mason, like hey. she before he even said his name. So kudos, okay. Joyce. 
And Mike Jarvis also knew, uh, what was the thing that he posted on? Let me just click find him, sorry. He had also called, oh, on the John Lennon double speed track. Like he yeah. knew that before you had posted that. So I thought- Nice. Um, let's see, a couple other questions out here. Um, let's see, hi, Professor Quarles from Jacob Brost. I would oh, be- hi, that's one of my students. Hi, Jacob. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Um, I would be curious to hear uh, a little bit about the Indian influence uh, influence Indian music had on Beatles music. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite um, aspects of the music. You know, it starts. Um, it's really interesting how they sort of came into their lives. It was on the filming of of the film Help, in which they had in one of the scenes sort of an Indian ensemble there with a with a sitar. And George Harrison said, Ooh, what is that? And got really interested, ended up buying one himself, kind of teaching himself how to play it. And the first time uh, that sort of a sitar was featured on like a Western pop recording is uh, the song called Norwegian Wood, um, which comes from the album uh, Rubber Soul. And so that one, you can sort of hear them start to experiment with writing, um, not using as many chords, uh, because Indian classical music um, a feature of that is that there's a constant drone, sort of one or two notes that are sort of providing a bed. And they got really interested in that idea because Western music moves chords all the time. <laughs> um, but here they were sort of having that more kind of stayed motion with the melodic motion over the top. And it really peaks um, for them uh, with On Sgt. Pepper. The, the opening track to side two of the LP is called Within You Without You, which is the only George song on the record. And interestingly, it's also the longest song on Sgt. Pepper. And it's this beautiful fusion of an Indian classical ensemble with an arrangement for Western strings done by George Martin. And so we have true Indian classical players and Western uh, classical players meeting uh, in this sort of um, Indian classical influenced song by, uh, you know, George Harrison, a British man. <laughs> and it's this really beautiful uh, dialogue between cultures. So, um, yeah, there's a couple different things there. There's a lot of different melodic ideas. They sneak in a lot of stuff in Revolver and Sgt. Pepper too. that little melodic ideas, these kind of things. Really, really fascinating. Thank you for that. Uh, Mary Ellen Dykeman asks, can you give the name of the book that you use in class? And I'm going to add to that, like any other book that you might recommend if people are yeah. interested in sort of analyzing the music like you did here today. For sure. So the main one that I use in my course, uh, because it's it's really comprehensive, um, is a book by Ian McDonald that's called Revolution in the Head. And um, he goes track by track of every song that's ever been released and, and some that haven't <laughs> um, by the And Beatles. thank you. Thank you to Travis Ramage. He did post that out here and I wasn't Great. sure what he was referencing. So yes. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> um, so we use that one and, you know, he, uh, he can, as my students sometimes will say, can be a bit of a curmudgeon sometimes on uh, certain tracks that people really like that he kind of takes a couple of stabs at. Um, but it provides you with some information uh, both with the, uh, like, who played on what. Um, sometimes he gets a couple things wrong, so you only got to check your sources. But um, it's a good starting place. And one of my most recent favorite books is by Rob Sheffield, who's a, one of the good critics uh, or best critics there at the Rolling Stone. And um, huge Beatle lover. And he wrote a book called Dreaming the Beatles that came out a couple years ago now. And it's a sort of a history of the band, but told in a really personal way. Rob has a really great um, personal voice that really puts you right in the action. And it's sort of like, it's like this, what we're doing right now, which is just having a conversation about this band that we all, for some reason, can't seem to stop talking about even, you know, 60 years after they've, or 50 years, sorry, I should say, after they've ended, you know, 51 years. So, so. true. So true. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll take one more question from social media and then I sure. have for you and then we'll wrap it up for today. Okay. Um, Bob Goff, do you consider Revolver the prequel to Sgt. Pepper studio-wise? Ah, yes. Okay. So um, here we enter the the, the big uh, debate of my entire life, which will continue forever. Is it Revolver or Sgt. Pepper, which is like the, the greatest Beatles album to me? And um, Revolver is really the first time in which, uh, it was not the first time, they were actually doing tiny little sort of sonic experiments even all the way back to Please Please Me, George Martin would do this kind of tape manipulation stuff on piano tracks to make them sound a little bit more interesting. Um, even back then, he called it the wind-up piano technique. Um, but 
Yes, there. It's really Jeff Emmerich, who's the engineer, who was a very young man at that time, uh, came onto the scene there with 66 with a revolver. And he is responsible for a lot of the different uh, ways in which that, that album sounds and then continuing that exploration in Sgt. Pepper. So, yeah, a lot of the stuff that you see in Sgt. Pepper has roots in Revolver. And again, you know, they share that same kind of bit of DNA in which they had time before for the first time to really um, slow down and really try new stuff. Um, but it really kicks into a new gear when they really quit touring and, and go off the way there. So, yeah, big fans of both, but definitely right. related. All right. Thank you for that. And you kind of answered my question I had for you, which was, what is your favorite album? Or maybe we could just say, what was your favorite, like, period? of? Yeah. Oh, it's so tough. You know, I get to ask that question all the time. What's your favorite Beatles song? Yeah. I, have to, I don't have children, but I have to imagine it's like picking your favorite kid. <laughs> you yeah. can't really, right? Um, and so for me, I think, actually, before I taught the class, um, and that was a really interesting thing. You know, I thought I knew a lot about the Beatles kind of before I decided to teach this class. And I learned so much and I was able to think about it in new ways just in taking that approach. And I had for a long time been a hardcore revolver is my favorite all the way. And I still think it probably edges out. But, you know, there is just something really magical about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the things that it gets written about it are really pretty true. Like, <laughs> um, it has a special thing. But, and, you know, I'll just sort of also do that in doing the class i gained a new appreciation which i'd always really liked it for the white album actually um sort of a, a, a dark horse in the maybe in the is it a good album idea i'm not sure but uh is it really is it maybe more experimental than any other record maybe yeah it's pretty wild Brandon Quarles, thank you so much for joining us today and taking us on that journey with you. Uh, and everybody, thanks for tuning in on Facebook and on the new platform screens that we're trying things out on. Feel free to give us your feedback, what you thought uh, on either platform. Join us next Tuesday, February 23rd at noon. We're going to be welcoming Managing Director Gavin Luter, who's going to be talking about the University Alliance Project. And uh, many cities and towns around Wisconsin trouble to draw economic impact to their small community. And Brandon's gonna talk about a prog program that has been addressing that issue. Um, also, please visit badgertalks.wis.edu. Uh, you can sign up for our email list there. You can see all of the upcoming Badger Talks live events and uh, consider making a donation also on that website. There's a link if you'd like to support future free programs. Uh, and also, you can request a speaker at your own upcoming event on the website there, too. So thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next week.